Dear students, welcome to this lecture. In today's lecture, we will be discussing history, culture and politics of South Asia. The lecture will comprise of following sections. First, we will have a brief introduction about South Asia as a region. Secondly, we will be familiarizing ourselves about geography, that's landmass and demography in South Asia. Third, we will quickly refresh ourselves with the historical trajectory of politics in South Asia. Fourth, we will be looking at various religions that emerged in South Asia and its impact on the larger culture. Dear students, the South Asian region, which comprises the present-day states of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Afghanistan, Bhutan and Maldives, has long been significant in the global civilizational and cultural phenomena. For 5000 years, South Asia has been one of the main centers of civilization, continually enriching societies beyond its boundaries. 4000 years ago, many millennia of human development reached a striking peak in the Indus Valley cities of Manjandaro and Harappa. Today, South Asia as a whole is the home to not less than one-fifth of the mankind. One of the most striking characteristics of this vast population is its homogeneity in terms of its social-cultural origin, music and dance, ritual, customs, modes of worship and literary ideals are similar throughout South Asia. However, in the course of time, Issues like ethnicity, language, religion, social attitudes and values differentiated the people of South Asia, turning them into distinct socio-cultural and political communities. This distinct socio-cultural community embraces enormous diversity, reflecting every level of human development from Stone Age tribesmen to Nobel Prize winners to believers of number of major religions Hinduism, Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, Christianity, etc. to the bearers of three racial strains Aryan, Dravidian and Proto-Australite and the speakers of about 1600 different languages. Dear students, let's have a look on the geography and demography of South Asia. The region is bounded to the north by a series of mountain ranges, the Hindkush to the northwest, the Koragoram range in the central north and Himalayas to the northeast. The Himalayan mountains dominate the physical landscape in the northern region of South Asia. Mount Everest is the tallest peak in the world at 29,035 feet on the opposite side of the Himalayas are two island countries of the coast of southern India. The first is Sri Lanka, a larger tropical island of India, southeast coast and on the other Republic of Maldives, an archipelago of the southwest coast of India. Maldives comprises of almost 1200 islands. That barely rise above the sea level. The highest elevation is merely 7 feet 7 inches. Only about 200 islands in the Maldives are inhabited. Three key rivers cross South Asia all originating from Himalayas. The Indus River which has been the center of human civilization for thousands of years starts in Tibet and flows through the center of Pakistan. The Ganges River flows through northern India creating a core region of the country. The Brahmaputra River flows through Tibet and then enters India from east where it meets up with the Ganges in Bangladesh to flow into Bay of Bengal. While the northern part of this region includes some of the highest elevations in the world, the Maldives in the south has some of the lowest elevations, some barely above sea level. 
the coastal regions in southern Bangladesh also have low elevations. When the seasonal reversal of winds called the monsoon arrives every year, there is a heavy flooding and it affects on the infrastructure of the region. The extensive Thar Desert in western India and parts of Pakistan, on the other hand, does not receive monsoon rains. In fact, much of the southwest Pakistan, a region called Balochistan, is dry with desert conditions. Farther south, along the east and west coast of India, are shorter mountain ranges called Ghats. The western Ghats reach as high as 8,000 feet, but average around 3,000 feet. Eastern Ghats are not as high as Western Ghats, but have similar physical qualities. The Deccan Plateau lies between the Eastern and Western Ghats. The monsoon rains ensures that an average of about 52 inches of rain per year falls on the Chota Nagpur Plateau, which has a tiger reserve and is also refuge for Asian elephants. South Asia has three of the ten most populous countries in the world. India is the second largest in the world and Pakistan and Bangladesh are numbers five and six respectively. Large populations are a product of large family size and high fertility rate. The rural population of South Asia has traditionally had large families. At the current rates of population growth, the population of South Asia will double in about 50 years. Population overgrowth for realm is a serious concern. An increase in population requires additional natural resources, energy and food production, all of which are in short supply in many areas. The population of South Asia is relatively young. In Pakistan, about 35% of population is under the age of 15, while about 30% of India's population, almost 1.2 billion people, are under the age of 15. Many of these young people live in rural areas, as most of the people of South Asia work in agriculture and live a subsistence lifestyle. As the population increases, the cities are swelling to accompany the growth in the urban population and the large influx of migrants arriving from rural areas. Dear students, it's important to engage briefly with the polity that exists in different periods in South Asia. The Indian subcontinent has a long history of human occupation and it is an area where cities independently developed and civilizations emerged. The earliest civilization on the subcontinent was the Indus Valley Civilization in existence from about 3300 BC to 1500 BC. The civilization is known for its planned structures. The cities and villages of the urban phase were planned with major streets going north-south and east-west. It had a system of drains that channeled waste water outside the city. Invasions by outsiders have the potential effect of bringing with them an influx of new ideas, concepts and technology. Likewise, the Indus Valley civilization no doubt had an impact on the region that it encompassed. Little is known of the historical events of earlier times. Some of the evidence we rely on today to discern historical events is gleaned from language, religion and ethnicity. Significant to South Asia is the presence of Indo-European languages. The Mauryan Empire existed between 322 to 185 BCE and was one of the most extensive and powerful political and military empires in ancient India. This empire was founded by Chandragupta Maurya in 322 BCE, who began to extend his regime westwards, easily conquering areas that have been disrupted by the expansion of Alexander the Great's armies. 
the Mauryan Empire was prosperous and greatly expanded the region's trade, agriculture and economic activities. One of the greatest emperors in the Mauryan dynasty was Ashoka the Great, who ruled over a long period of peace and prosperity. Ashoka embraced Buddhism and focused on peace for much of his rule. Islam became a powerful force in South Asia upon its diffusion to the subcontinent. Muslim dynasties or kingdoms that rule India between 1206 and 1526 are referred to collectively as the Delhi Sultanate. The Delhi Sultanate ended in 1526 when it was absorbed into expanding Mughal Empire. The Islamic Mughal Empire ruled over much of northern and central India from the 1500s to about the middle of the 19th century. After 1725, it began to decline rapidly because of combination of factors with European colonialism adding the finishing touch. The Mughal Empire had been religiously tolerant but Muslim oriented. The force of colonialism was felt around the world including South Asia. South Asia provides an excellent example of colonialism's role in establishing most of the current political borders in the world. From the 16th century onwards, ships from colonial Europe began to arrive in South Asia to conduct trade. The British East India Company was chartered in 1600 to trade in Asia and India. They traded in spices, silk, cotton and other goods. Later, to take advantage of the conflicts and bitter rivalries between kingdoms, European powers began to establish colonies. Britain controlled South Asia from 1857 to 1947. The British no longer controlled South Asia after 1947. Local resistance and the devastating effect of World War II meant the British Empire could not be controlled as it was once. Great Britain pulled away from empire building to focus on its own redevelopment. Upon the British withdrawal from India, Britain realized the immense cultural differences between Muslims and Hindus and created political boundaries based on these differences. West Pakistan was carved out of Western India, East Pakistan was carved out of Eastern India. However, new borders separating Hindu and Muslim majorities ran through population groups and some of the populations now found itself to be on the wrong side of the border. The West Pakistan India partition grew into a tragic civil war as Hindus and Muslims struggled to migrate to their country of choice. More than one million people died in the civil war, a war that is still referred to in today's political dialogue between Pakistan and India. Almost after 25 years, another civil war would erupt in 1970s between West Pakistan and East Pakistan. The civil war lasted about three months and resulted in the creation of the sovereign countries of Pakistan and Bangladesh. The name Bangladesh is based on the Bengali ethnicity of most of the people who live there. Dear students, to understand a region like South Asia, it becomes important to understand the growth of various religions that emerged in South Asia and its impact on the larger culture. The most important cultural determinant when viewed from a pan-South Asian perspective is religion. South Asia contains adherence of at least seven major religions Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Sikhs, Jains and Parsis not to speak of innumerable subgroups and sects. Religious elegance implies for more than a private belief or pattern of group behavior. 
even the present political map of region is largely determined by religion. The partition of British India in 1947 was effected to secure the separate establishment of Muslim majority areas as the new state of Pakistan. The story of South Asian religious life begins with the river Indus and its tributaries. The Indus was the center of earliest complex urban culture of which we have evidence in the region, the Indus Valley or Harappa culture. By 1200 BCE, the Vedic culture of Arya came to dominate the central plains of north. Vedic culture is so named for the literature of the period, the Veda. The word Veda comes from Sanskrit root Vid, to know, and Veda generally means wisdom, or in this context, a set of texts that deal primarily with ritual. The Veda provides insight into the religious life and worldview of the Sanskrit speaking people, a class of ritual specialists or priests who transmitted the texts orally within families or lineages for generations. A key concept found in Vedic texts is sacrifice, which often involve animals or plants and non-living materials like spices and cloth. Prominent among the gods invoked and assuaged through sacrifice was the warrior god Indra, a testament to the militaristic nature of early Indo-Aryan culture and Agni, the god of fire. By the middle of last millennium BCE, the tribal society associated with Vedic culture was settled and urbanized. Within this society, renunciation became a valid social option among diverse sectors, providing space for Shramnas who sought liberation from the world of suffering through austerity. The changing worldview described in the Upanishads is also evident in two other contemporary major movements, those founded by Mahavira, Jainism, and Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, Buddhism. The Buddhist world in the beginning of the first millennium was dynamic and diverse, as the new faith separated out from South Asia to Southeast Asia, China and beyond. Within South Asia, it was centered within large-scale monasteries and scholastic centers such as that at Nalanda in the Indian state of Bihar. The Jain tradition, on the other hand, has continued uninterpreted into modernity with the majority of its adherents in Western India. The religion that now we call Hinduism, the term itself is of recent vintage, began to recognizable shape in the first millennium C, drawing upon Vedic roots. In this period, the epics Mahabharata containing Bhagavad Gita and Ramayana were composed along with the Puranas. The Mahabharata recounts the tragic conflict while the Ramayana relates the tale of King Rama who was exiled from his kingdom for 14 years in company with his wife Sita and his brother Lakshman. The Puranas provide stories of the gods who were to take the central place within developing religion now known as Hinduism, Vishnu, Shiva and the goddess among others. The three divinities Vishnu, Shiva and the goddess represent three main deities worshipped in Hindu practice. Those who worship Vishnu are Vishnava, those who worship Shiva are Shiva and those who worship goddess are Shakta from Shakti or power, the feminine force the goddess is said to possess. Brahma is not often the object of worship. Other deities have gained in popularity such as Ganesha and Hunuman. Temples acted as both religious and social centers in the dynamic urban hubs of 
the regional kingdoms established in the wake of Gupta power. As the regional kings and princes gained power, they often sought legitimacy by granting Brahmins large areas from which to collect taxes to finance temple development. Temples provided homes for the central deity and images enshrined within represented the deity and in many cases embodied it. It was Bhakti movement that transformed both temple-based and personal forms of worship. It started in southern India in 8th century CE among saints who sang of their love for God in Tamil rather than in Sanskrit, the language of Vedic orthodoxy. Bhakti insisted upon the immediate, direct apprehension of the God, whether he or she is contained within a form or unknowable formless. Islam began to shape the culture and history of South Asia from the end of first millennium C, when Arab traders first came to the shores of Gujarat. In considering South Asian society, we must remember not only to look at eastern lands where Hinduism and Buddhism and the South Asian languages and cultures associated with them took hold, but also to the west from where other models of religion, culture and language were brought into South Asian world. Although the first interaction between Muslims and non-Muslims in South Asia took place through trade, the presence of Islam was also shaped by the military campaigns establishing Muslim power in the north and centre. Certain elements of Islamic belief such as its monotheism and skewal of images in the worship brought about religious conflict in the region. However, although this conflict formed a part of interaction between Muslims and non-Muslims in South Asia, there was a great complexity to the interaction among Muslim rulers and their mostly non-Muslim subjects, as well as between those who converted to Islam and those who did not. Indian art of the period, for example, provides vivid testimony to the way in which West Asian influencers were integrated within South Asian styles and techniques giving birth to a vibrant and unique tradition. Sufi saints shaped the development of popular Islam just as Bhakti saints. Sufis, many of them poets as well, spoke of their direct experience of God and the need to get beyond just formal religious observance to a true and immediate religious engagement. Building a community around the guru-student relationship was fundamental to the development of Sikh tradition, one of the world's newer faiths. Guru Nanak formed a community of disciples after he had revelation of the formless nature of God. His songs and those of later Gurus were recorded in the text known as Adi Granth, the first collection. His monotheistic vision of God is seen by many as a compromise between Hindus and Muslim ideas, but such a self-conscious rapprochement between the two traditions was apparently not Nanak's intention. Like other religious speakers of the time, he experienced a religious vision in keeping with many cultural influences that formed him, but in his own distinctive and unique mode. The advent of British power and wearing of centralized Mughal power brought about key changes in South Asian religious life in the 19th century and 20th century. Religions came to be defined in a particular way through the enactment of census with its discrete categories for Hindus, Muslims and for separate castes. In actuality, these categories may have been much more fluid than the census allowed for. Many groups, such as Sikhs, so-called low-caste people, those who followed syncretic traditions that blended elements of separate religions, were left in the margins and had to fight to be recognized.
Dear students, to conclude today's lecture, we need to look at South Asia as a peaceful region and what is the way forward. People from diverse cultures and religions have coexisted in the past in the South Asian region. The mutual tolerance and grand vision displayed by our predecessors seem to be at low premium today. Most of the new states including South Asia followed 19th century European model of nation states. This state centric orientation with modern majoritarian nature of state brought about severe problems such as gaps between rich and poor, discrimination between ethnic minorities and finally hostile and conflicting relations among regional countries themselves. No doubt the region has witnessed the interstate and intrastate conflicts, but there is a possibility of regaining the peace and prosperity in the region. Some of the initiatives in this direction are, there is a need for cultural exchange which are not based solely on the state's initiative, but are more inclusive and active at non-governmental level. The territorial rule and the division of national boundaries in 1947 has been main hurdle towards reconciliation. Now in the age of globalization, while preserving the indigenous traditions and cultures, we should go for a flexible notion of sovereignty and nation state system. If South Asian nations rigid perspective on the nation state and modernity can be replaced with a borderless and unified South Asia. The information revolution which is occurring in South Asian region along with other parts of the world is changing people's consciousness at the grassroots level. With such reconciliation, we might expect that loyalty exclusively addressed to a nation and ethnicity or culture causing wars and ethnic conflicts could probably be extinguished and a popular culture beyond national boundaries would emerge. Moreover, the exchange programs beyond national boundaries in South Asia and between ethnic minorities sharing similar cultural conditions will be a way forward. Indeed, all in South Asia today want peace, harmony and development, which can be ensured only through understanding, cooperation and friendship. Dear students, I hope you enjoyed today's lecture and we are in a better position to understand further debates and issues on South Asia. Thank you.